In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please take your seats. This is perhaps as good an opportunity as any to let you know that this service ends somewhat inconclusively because it's the first part of a three-part ceremony which ends, in the end, on Easter morning. Or perhaps, as we Christians perhaps ought to call it, on the day of the Feast of the Resurrection. Easter associated with that hormone oestrogen so named because it relates to fertility. Easter was the name of the pagan god who was worshipped during this month before the church arrived. And perhaps it's the more Celtic among us that has uh, continued to use that name, Easter, for this particular feast day and celebration. I expect the more Roman Catholic among us would prefer to speak of the Feast of the Resurrection. One joined in and assimilated, the other supplanted So this is the first opening gambit of this three-day commemoration, celebration, reflection. And so the service doesn't end with a blessing, rather the uh, spring cleaning and the removal of uh, the fabrics from the altar as that sort of last step in this Passion Tide fortnight, where in some churches crosses are covered. We were discussing this in the vestry. Icons are reversed or removed And any signs and semblance, such as ringing the bells, which I haven't been doing for the whole of the season of Lent, really sort of present that bare challenge of what it might be like if there was no God. Just as we give up some of the blessings that God has given us, maybe some of us have done that during this Lenten season. Some might have taken things up as a cross to bear during this season. But it's all part of that entering in to this spirit and sensation of loss. It's a fasting. It's a deliberate giving up of that which we could claim to learn more about ourselves and the world in which we live. Good Friday, traditionally, preaching the Passion, a three-hour worship takes place in the afternoon, perhaps with veneration of the cross, perhaps with some preaching and uh, with a Mass or Holy Communion in one kind. Saturday, a day of quietness and loss. There's nothing else very much happens, although here we will be having a vigil in the evening. You're very welcome to attend at 8 o'clock. And then on the Sunday, the culmination of this extra-long, unique ceremony with a Holy Communion celebrating the Feast of the Resurrection, bringing it all together. Some would argue that the meal that Jesus celebrated, engaged with, on the evening that we are remembering today, whether it was actually on the 6th of April, we need not necessarily know. But he had a meal with his friends, and at least some of the Gospel writers make the connection with this particular time and season hinting, suggesting, claiming that Jesus is effectively our Passover lamb. Those that believe from Jewish or Gentile background that our doorposts are marked with his blood. We share this meal figuratively of that lamb meal. Some Christian churches eat a seder meal Some Jewish people consider that's a good thing and others, they don't like it quite so much because it's their feast and not ours. But if you've never been to one, I would uh, recommend you consider it at some point. We might even put one on here in years to come. It gives an idea, a taste, literally, of the bitter herbs, of the lamb, of some of the ceremonial, and it brings alive that Passover meal and some of the Christian echoes and overlays and gloss that we put on it. It's perhaps interesting for us to note that then it was to be eaten at pace 
ready for people to leave, just as perhaps some people in Ukraine might over the last months and years, eaten the last slice of bread, had the last glass of milk, with their mobile phone in their backpack, as they heard the sound of shelling, leaving in haste. So it was with God's people. At the time of the Exodus, no doubt at the time of the pogroms and the Nazi occupation of Europe. So we should be ready to die with our boots on, ready to go. And that's that part of that strange tension that we have a three-day ceremony to relax into. We're giving up, we're taking up, it's mystical, it's perhaps peaceful, it's perhaps challenging. But prayer is also active. And we need to eat quickly and be ready to go. It's also intriguing, is it not, that when Jesus celebrates this Passover meal with his friends, he knows that there is a snake in the camp. There are people gathering around this table, maybe even this evening, but certainly when we gather to share the Mass, the breaking of bread in our churches, we will be sharing it with people with whom we disagree. We heard this morning about one of the stories of one of the Marys covering a part of Jesus' head or feet with precious perfume. And either Judas and or the disciples and or the gathered people around said that money should have been given to the poor. Should we be giving money to the poor? Should we be spending money making this building more appropriate for its context? We will have to agree to disagree. Should we be marrying everybody that comes forward to have their relationship endorsed by God? Or only some? Should we be as careful to talk to those who are not married but are heterosexual and receiving from this table? There are some that would say we should be equally severe. There are some that would say we should be equally gracious. But we may have to again agree to disagree should people be confirmed or can anybody have a sip or a nibble. And again, we may have to agree to disagree. But I would hope that there are none amongst us who are so concerned at the way we are going that they're not going to betray me or any of us necessarily to the authorities for going that one step too far. I never quite know with Judas whether he was hoping that by choosing a quiet place whilst the town was full of revelry that that might be a quiet and easy place to start the revolution. Only one or two temple guards to overthrow. We could take their weapons, we could take their armour, we could hole up on that Mount of Olives and instead of as King David disappear into exile, instead of being strung up on a cross, maybe I can ferment this rebellion even now. Give Jesus a hand. Don't want him to be getting cold feet. Maybe he was actually trying to be helpful. And the other side of it, of course, is that if Jesus hadn't been through that mockery of a trial, hadn't been hung on that gibbet, hadn't died for us, then we would not have life. How else would that be achieved? It's almost like the poor Babylonians being told by God to take over Jerusalem and then being punished for doing that themselves later on. I feel for Judas. And even in our own day, the poor chap gets a bad press. It wasn't actually in my benefice, but down in Dorset, there is a church of uh, St. Nicholas. Just trying to wait for the name of the place to come to my mind, but it won't. Maybe I'll tell you afterwards if I remember. Um, and uh, they have famously, they lost their stained glass windows due to a bomb during the Second World War. And uh, 
So their windows are all etched, plain glass, but with etchings on them. And it's been so long that I can't even remember the chap who did the windows. But um, one of the windows, I think, came later, and it's beautiful. It's Judas, with, um, I think, on a noose, but to the coins that are dropping out of his hands, poetic license, turn into flowers as they fall. But the PCC didn't want it as a proper window, so from the inside of the church it looks like a wall, you have to go to the outside of the church to look at it, to find it. And uh, that may be a metaphor for us as we are turning our icons round, closing down, opening up. During these three days, how far are we prepared to go to find the truth in ourselves, in others that we hate, despise, misunderstand? How far are we prepared to go to find the truth in God, that once dead Jew, Palestinian, Syrian, put to death, that we may have life. He became isolated, that we may belong. He became impotent, that we may have agency. And when I say us, we, I don't mean the handful of us gathered around in here, but the people of our towns, the villages, our family and friends, those with whom we are connected, those for whom we pray, those for whom we weep. This is a prayer for us all. Interestingly, in our Gospel reading, we are told, where I am going, you cannot come. Elsewhere, we are told that where you are going, you know the way. I'm preparing a room. It is a confusing space, even for those of us who believe. Let us be kind and friendly to ourselves and to those with whom we share this narrow way, as well as those who are so discombobulated and confounded that they won't even cross the threshold. And how do we help and support and give hope to ourselves, to our friends and to those outside this building? The conclusion of our Gospel reading gives us a commandment, if not a clue, I give you a new commandment, a new mandate, Monday, Thursday, the Thursday of the mandate. I give you a new mandate on this mandate Thursday, that you love one another. You love one another. Not just the way you think you should, just as I have loved you. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. I hate the Gospels of, well, the Gospel of John. I hate the writings of John in the Scripture because it's, to me, so impossible to do that. But that is what we are instructed, directed, told we must do. Sometimes when I write policies, when we read policies, we struggle with whether we actually should use the word must It's easy to say you ought, or you might like to consider. Here's a suggestion. But uh, Liz has had some medical advice recently. She'll be told, she must. So we talked a little bit about that. It wasn't a suggestion, it was a direction. You must. Dial 999 if nobody has been in touch with you in the next hour. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. We're not just being told to do it. But if we think, oh, well, I can love, I can make somebody a cup of tea if they knock on the door, I can hold the door open, just as I have loved you. That is the level and the quality of the love that perhaps we might be able to aspire to. We've been directed to love each other as God has loved us. And as if that was not enough, that's how people will know that what we're talking about is right and true, that there really is a God in heaven, or at least there really is a God, even if God isn't up in the sky somewhere. By this, the way we love each other, by this, everyone will know that we are disciples. We believe in this stuff. Everyone will know that you follow me if you have love for one another. May God be merciful. May God help us through the words and the sacrament and through the spirit 
by each other's comfort, companionship and support, endeavour, strain, strife, to at least read, mark, learn and inwardly digest this instruction, even if we find it impossible to fulfil it. Amen.